the floor beneath your feet. Feel that sense of gravity keeping you connected to this beautiful living rock that we spend our lives on. And feel that the presence of that beautiful rock and expand your awareness to the entire room that you're in, the whole building, the whole neighborhood, the continent that you're on right now. And the entirety of Mother Earth. She's always there right beneath us, making sure that we stay safe as we float through this beautiful, spacious universe. Now allow your awareness to come back in towards you towards your city towards the room that you're in and back to your body and with another deep breath when you're ready go ahead and open your eyes and welcome <laughs> thank you for taking that moment to make sure that we're all very present here i know that it is a Monday, and who knows what happens on Mondays before the time that it is for you. There's a lot. <laughs> so you have introduced yourselves in the chat. Thank you for that. I want to make sure that everyone is familiar with me. There are some very familiar faces in here. Um, so some of you may know this already, but I am Emily Stamets. I have been a theater lifer. I also call myself a grown-up theater kid. Um, ever since fifth grade, when in summer school, we were doing a Greek history play, and I was cast as a minor Greek goddess, which was very exciting. I had lines, and I memorized my lines, and then I had to miss a day of summer school, and I got, quote unquote, demoted to costumes crew, which that teacher has no idea what kind of path she sent me down, but I'm grateful to that teacher every day because it led me into a path of really understanding the entirety of theater and all of the possibilities and all of the, the different ways that I could be creative in the world. So thank you. I don't even remember her name, but thank you to her. <laughs> um, I taught middle and high school theater for about 10 years. Um, I do have master's degrees in theatrical design, so I love looking at the whole production, um, as well as a master's in education leadership. One of my favorite things is to really look at how all three of those branches um, intersect. So how can our work in theater interform, inter Interform? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How can it inform leadership work? How can education inform our work in theater? And you know, what are all the different ways that all those different branches can improve one another? My favorite fashion accessory is cat hair. Um, and I will never say no to my cat sitting on my lap. I don't care how much black I'm wearing. And my husband will also tell you that uh, I also wear a lot of chicken shit because I spend a lot of time in my chicken coop and I have a tendency to not change my clothes in between, which is, I don't recommend it. It's not the greatest practice, but sometimes I can't help myself. <laughs> and I, for the last four years, have been a coach for theatrical and creative people. Um, and I now specialize in people who are starting new things and really turning their eyes to new ventures. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Okay, you are in the right place today if you maybe like get an idea for a new show, but you get this voice or this maybe feeling in your like chest that says, I'll never be able to afford a production like that. Or maybe you want to start a business, but you don't know anything about business. And so you just keep thinking, well, I mean, it sounds like a good idea, but I really should go get my MBA before I even try right? Um, or maybe you keep opening an empty document on your laptop. I know we have some writers in this group. So you open this empty document, maybe you get a sentence in and you're like, oh, you know, the stories that I have to tell, they're just not like, what am I even doing? Like, they're just not important enough. No one wants to see or hear or read the stories that I have to tell. And you're in the right place if there's sort of a gurgly red blob in your belly that's on repeat 
saying things like, who are you to try to do this? You're not ready. Other people are better and you're not good enough. Okay, so if any of that resonates, you can give me a thumbs up <laughs> or say in the chat, what does your inner critic say? And really quickly, of course, I'm a teacher, so we have to go over some of the um, uh, details of the workshop. So my goals today, and I hope that you join me in these goals, is number one, most importantly, to improve your awareness of your inner critic and how it might be affecting your life and your creative pursuits. And then, of course, give you some tools to manage the inner critic when it starts to get loud. We're gonna be here for about 90 minutes. And this is a free workshop. I'm happy to support the creative community with work like this, um, but please do help me out by completing the survey link. I'll put it in the chat at the end of the workshop. And I will also, e it will actually be emailed out at, uh, in about 45 minutes. So it's gonna land in your email box. It should be really easy to get to. Your input is super important to me to help me make sure that this workshop is good um, and that I can continue improving. And I am recording. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I'm so glad I put this reminder here for myself because I always forget. Recording in progress. There we go. This workshop is being recorded. It is for my own private purposes so that I can capture anything that happens in the chat that I am not paying attention to, or if there's like a really good moment that comes up and I wanna remember exactly how that went, um, that that's when I'll use those recordings. I will never share any part of this video that has your face or your voice without your explicit permission. Okay, here's what we're gonna go through today. We're first gonna start with a look at what is the inner critic? Why do we need to deal with it? Why does it even, why is it a problem that needs to be solved? Then we're gonna meet your inner critic, which is super fun. And then I'll give you a bunch of tools to help manage your inner critic when it pops up in your life. There's gonna be plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, I, I can stay for a little bit after the workshop is technically over um, if anyone has anything that's unresolved, but I think we're a small enough group, we should be able to answer all of the questions that come up in the meantime. I'm sorry, let me just check in with these folks who were having trouble logging in. So give me one second, everybody. I wanna make sure that everyone who really wants to be here is here. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. I appreciate you. There we go. Let me know. I don't know, technology, everybody. It's like so wonderful and also sometimes so confusing and awful. <laughs> now my computer's freezing. There we go. Okay. I think that'll do it. Perfect. All right. Um, awesome. So that's what we're going over today. Let me know if you have any questions about any of that. We are going to do a mix of me like sharing information directly like this um, and also a lot of group sharing. Um, we'll break into partners of two for um, some moments. Um, so there's lots of different ways that we're gonna be learning. And of course we will be doing some journaling. Um, if it's comfortable for you to do pen and paper, that's fantastic. If you would prefer to speak into a voice recorder, that's also great, or just talk your thoughts out loud. Um, or if you're a movement person, you can just set up a video recorder and dance your way through all of the questions. It's all gonna work today. Okay, so this workshop is part of my recipe for starting new things. The acronym, I think that's the right word, is which I'm definitely going to have to fix because it certainly does not roll off the tongue, but that's where we're at today. So these are six um, strategies and mindsets that over the past four years of working with people one on one have come up thematically as consistent issues or places of like great epiphany that I think are really wonderful to share. Um, and some of them we talk about a lot, some of them we don't talk about at all. So the first one is to practice and to really develop a mindset of um, practice over perfection. The next one is patterns or p -p patterns. So breaking old patterns of thought and action and replacing them with behaviors and thought patterns that are more useful. Support, so recruiting more support than we think we're gonna need. We always think we can do things um, by ourselves, especially those of us raised in America and the Western world. 
Um, spark is keep the vision alive. There was something that happened. There was an idea that came to you or something that landed in your heart that, that brought you here, that brought you, uh, that makes you think that there's something new to be created. And it's really important to keep that spark alive and to keep your eyes on it. And then timeline, this is one I don't hear people talking about very much at all, but really creating a timeline for creation that is specific to you and not worrying about the external world. Okay, so like this is a great example. Um, right now we're in the, you know, the beginning of the year. A lot of people are saying, it's the new year. It's time to do these new things. And like, sometimes, yeah, but like that also, the calendar does not exactly line up with your energy flow. And it's okay to do things a little differently at different times. And finally, theater or whatever your particular creative background is, you have done projects before, you have created things, you have uh, um, completed things, and it's really valuable to take what you learned and the skills that you gained doing those previous projects and to continue to apply them to the new work you want to do, even if it's in a different arena. Okay, today's workshop really lands in the category of patterns, breaking old thought patterns um, and replacing them with more useful ones. And next week, I'll be doing workshops on the same schedule. And next week, we're really going to be playing with the idea of practice and cultivating a practice mindset. And I'll share a link so that you can register for that workshop as well. Here we go. Now we start the workshop. What is the inner critic? If you don't mind, please in the chat, tell me how do you define your inner critic? The thing that says binge watching succession is a better use of my time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I might have worded this a little badly in grammar. And Let's see if it comes out okay. it's easier for you to unmute yourself and say it out loud. We're a small enough group that I think we can manage that. How do you define your inner critic? The inner critic is the voice that ampl amplifies all of the negative feedback and toxic interactions from discouragement that I have experienced from other people yes. and makes it much more than it actually is. Mm -hmm. Reflecting upon it too much than is healthy and supportive for my growth and success. Yep, absolutely. A lot of times those thoughts that come up um, and turn into the inner critic have come from people that are not ourselves. <laughs> Um, the voice that is negative in order to protect. Yes, absolutely. A really simple definition um, that I think kind of encompasses, of course, we all think of our inner critic differently. We have slightly different relationships with it. It manifests in different ways for different people. Um, but a good sort of general overview is that it's the voice of self-doubt. Um, and yeah, I'm going to leave that there. It's the voice of self-doubt. Your inner critic can come up around your professional life, of course, your artistic pursuits, your family or love life, your place in your community. That's a big one for me. Really the question, do I belong here? Or do people like me here? It's really anything in your life that's asking you to grow, asking you to become something new, something different, something bigger. Okay, a lot of this work is inspired by Tara Moore, the author of Playing Big. I want to give credit where credit is due. I highly recommend her book, especially for women, um, especially for women who are raised in America and uh, the sort of westernized world. Okay, so why does our inner critic matter? Here's the deal. We all have an inner critic. There's not a single person in the world, I don't care how successful they are, there's not a single person that does not have this voice of self-doubt. It's totally normal. 
It's actually a healthy survival instinct. Um, but letting your inner critic sit in the director's chair or the driver's seat really has some serious consequences for our lives and our progress. So right now in the chat, if you can just reflect and share, um, what is something, is there an opportunity that you've missed out on because you were letting your inner critic run the show? You can share that in the chat. Is there anything that you can think of that you didn't quite make happen for yourself because of that voice of self-doubt? Emily? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not able to type. I'm using okay. um, a rickety old tripod in my phone and it's just like so much going on and my son was trying to help me set up this laptop and I don't know what- I'm It's totally fine. Do you can, so just be, we're a small enough group. So just go ahead and unmute yourself and say what you wanna say throughout the workshop. Okay, thank you. I, I'll just um, bring up this book. I just started reading it. It ties in great with this class. Uh, it's more of a spiritual, um, self-help book, How to Do the Work by Nicole LaPera. You'll find her on Instagram, but it's about recognizing your patterns, heal from your past and create your yourself. And it's like a mind, body, soul connection and tying in with what you just asked us. I feel like the voices of my parents have guided me much of my life. I love them, but they are perfectionists and manipulators and they've kept me from going out into the world and accomplishing these big dreams of um, the Peace Corps or a theater major or an art major. Oh, you can't make money doing that. Oh, it's dangerous or, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And I'm a pleaser, I'm a codependent. So I'm learning now to um, get back to loving myself and trusting myself and that instinct, that gut intuition. And I'm I'm sorry I've missed your other classes, but Deb Kinney told me about you today, and I love your energy, and I'm rambling, but I just want you to know that in case I don't share. I love your energy and your confidence and your your go-forwardness. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, and I'm so glad you're here. Um, I think there's definitely going to be some strategies that we do today and some... Um, like mindset tricks that we're going to do today and work on together that are definitely going to be helpful in helping you to move forward, even with those voices still in the background. I'm really glad you're here today. And I'm definitely going to check out that book. So thank you for the recommendation. Oh yeah, sure. And I'll look for the Tara Moore <clears throat> playing mm -hmm. big, was it? Okay. Yeah, playing big. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Beautiful. You're welcome. Okay. And in the chat, um, Blair says, I'm sure there are countless jobs I didn't bother applying for. Yes. There have also been times I didn't try to make friendship connections. Oh my gosh, this is resonating a lot with me personally um, because I convinced myself people weren't interested in me or already had enough friends, so there was no place for me. Ooh, that's big. Mm -hmm. um, and Anthony saying opportunities, mostly including auditions and other connections around the city, not looking enough or too often. Mm -hmm. If I have more confidence in my abilities and experience so far, I won't let the doubts hold me back any longer. Absolutely. I'm so excited for what is going to happen with everybody after um, you get some of these tools today. And this is going to be so great. Okay, so that's why it matters. Here's some hard truths. So let's take a deep breath. We're going to just absorb these and let them be the truth that they are. The first one is that your inner critic is never going to go away. You can be a billionaire, you can be, uh, you can go live in the mountains and create a ceramic sculpture every day for the rest of your life. Whatever success looks like to you, you can be that successful and that those thoughts will still be there. Okay. So just accept that now <laughs> we get to learn to live with them. Um, it's actually part of a deeply embedded survival instinct and it is constantly on the lookout for danger. Now this instinct started to develop way before human beings were even human beings. So pre-language, um, and the reason that we hear it as voices is simply that we are linguistic beings. So we take those feelings and we can turn it into words, which is actually really great for us because turning it into words makes it something that we can play with and use. But that original instinct is way back from like our brainstem wizard brain times. And it's a part of our neurological system that started developing about 400 million years ago. 
So we are not going to get rid of it in our lifetime. <laughs> it is not going to go away. Instead, we are going to learn to live with it and to create wonderful things in spite of it. Okay, so that's the goal today. Um, I like to think of it. Oh, what else we got here? Oh, no, 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 no. Go back, go back. We're not there yet. We're not there. Yet. There we are. Okay. Oh, my system does not want to land on this slide. There we go. Okay. I like to think of it like this. We're in a cave. Okay. So like way back in the caveman times. Um, and you are living in this cave and like maybe you have a campfire. You maybe have some food stored away, but it's pretty dark in there. Um, it's probably pretty cold. The floor is really hard. It's not actually the greatest place to be. And yet your inner critic on the inside is thinking, sure, this place kind of sucks, but there might be a saber tooth tiger waiting for us outside the cave. So it's actually better, even though right here is not the greatest, it's actually better for us to stay here instead of going outside and risking the greater danger of the saber tooth tiger. So no matter how uncomfortable you are, no matter how mediocre you feel like things are right now, your inner critic is always going to be like, it's fine. This is, we know what this is. We know what's going on here. This is safer than anything that like, than taking the risk of what could be outside. Totally normal. It's a great thing, right? It is the thing that keeps us from walking into the middle of a street or jumping off a cliff without the appropriate equipment. <laughs> but the problem is that because that part of our brain developed so long ago, when it was really deciding between stuff that could kill us versus everything else, it doesn't know the difference between a saber tooth tiger and like a bad presentation at work. That part of ourselves thinks that if we um, write a, a bad play, okay, or like, mess up our, our lines on stage, it thinks we're going to die. It can't differentiate between that thing going wrong and a tiger eating us. Okay, so it's just this really overactive safety instinct. So thinking of it that way, I actually think it's kind of sweet. It's like, oh, you're just trying to protect me. It's really misguided and kind of terrible, but at least it, it, it means well, right? So here we go. Well, let's, let's start to get to know your inner critic specifically. This is when I'm going to have you open your journal, lick the tip of your quill, however you're processing today. If you're using a voice recorder, make sure you're on mute and you can pull that out now. And I'm going to ask the questions. They'll also go up on the screen if you're more of a visual person and a reader. And we're just going to start to explore how does your personal inner critic um, how does it manifest for you? It's going to be a little different for everybody. So the first question is, what does your inner critic say specifically? What are the specific common thoughts that come up for you that you can really identify as that voice of self-doubt? And you may also want to think here about what are some beliefs that that inner critic seems to have about the world? Is there anyone from your past life or your current life that your inner critic seems to echo? Is there any person or figure or ideology that this voice seems to build on?
how would you describe your inner critic? Is it people pleasing, anxious, persistent? Pick five words that describe your inner critic. And Julia just joined us. Julia, we're doing some journaling about our inner critic. The questions are there on the screen for you and I'll leave them up for a moment. And now what is your inner critic afraid of more than anything? What is the thing that it is the most scared of? Okay, so I'm going to leave those questions up. Make sure that you're capturing all of your thoughts. And when you're ready, um, I would like to hear, did you learn anything new about your inner critic as you moved through those questions? And you can go ahead and share in the chat. What came up for you? What new insights did you gain? And this is just our very first layer of exploration here. And my inner critic is a lot like my shadow self. It takes the worst parts of me, trying to draw me away from being the best version I can be. It wants me to be selfish and not share my gifts with the world. Mm -hmm. I realize my inner critic echoes something that in my experience is sort of a common catchphrase with acting and theater teachers, <laughs> which is if you can do anything else besides be an actor, do that. I've definitely heard that message. I see some folks nodding. My inner critic echoes many of my past romantic partners. Mm -hmm. I think I'm more afraid of mediocrity than actual failure, but maybe that's also protective because it's too scary to even think about taking the really big swing that could bring the really big crash and burn failure. That's a big topic I'm gonna to touch on next week. So I do encourage you to come next week, Blair, if you can. I'm gonna talk about some very practical tools um, about that, that big, scary idea and how to, how to still make those ideas that are so big that they're terrifying, how to still make them happen. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for sharing, everybody. Okay, here's our next step here. We're gonna do what I call casting your inner critic. Just like we would cast a show, we're taking this character that you're starting to develop. You have an idea of its fears, its desires, some of its personality traits. Um, and we're going we're gonna to really create a, a fully fleshed out character here. I mean, in our brains, obviously not flesh flesh. I guess if you wanted to get some clay, you could totally mold it. Um, but we're doing it in our brains. Um, but we're going to flesh out this character, which has many, many uh, awesome, positive um, ramifications and we'll do some of them today. So still in your journal or in your voice recorder, whatever works for you. 
and you might want to draw some pictures here. Okay. So especially anyone who's, um, who, I mean, you can do stick figures. It's fine. It doesn't, no one's going to see this. It doesn't matter how good your picture is. So if drawing feels better for you, you can do that instead of writing. The first big question is what does your inner critic look like? And so if you tune in, it can help to close your eyes here. Tune into that part of yourself that says these things and thinks this way about the world. What does it look like? And there's no wrong answer here. Whatever the first thing that came to you is probably the right thing. And also this can change and adapt over time as you learn more about yourself and as you work with this idea. Is your inner critic sitting or standing or something else? How do they hold their body? And it can be helpful here to even take that body position for a moment, explore into that, see what that feels like. What are they wearing? And explore head to toe here. Is there anything on their head? Do they have any accessories? Are there layers? How old or new is what's on their body? If they're wearing shoes, what do those shoes look like? What expression is on their face most often? And again, it can be helpful to put your own face into this position, see what that feels like. Your inner critic is holding something in, in their hand. What is it? What are they holding? And what's in their immediate surroundings? Where is it that they're hanging out? If it feels right to give your inner critic a name today, go ahead and do that. And if a name doesn't come, that's okay. It might come later. It's kind of hard to name it. Okay. Alrighty. So finish up the thought that you're writing down right now. I think everyone's writing today. I don't see anybody interpretive dancing, unfortunately. 
I always hope that someday someone's going to do that. <laughs> okay, and what I'd like to do now is I'm going to break us all into groups of two. Oops, where are we going here? My, I'm sorry, my mouse keeps skipping things. There we are. We're going to break into groups of two. So you'll be in a breakout group with one other group. Um, Scott and Deb, is it okay if I put you guys together just so that you'll talk to each other? Does that feel comfortable? Great. Um, and here's what we're going to do. You'll have about two minutes to just say hello to your partner. Who are you? What do you do? Where are you? All of those good questions. And I'll send reminders through the breakout room as well here. Then the first partner is going to share about their inner critic and probably about, I said three minutes here, but I think two minutes is plenty. And after about two minutes of just telling your partner who your inner critic is, just describe them. Then the partner is going to have, then this is how I'm going to switch it. The partner is going to have then three minutes to ask some curious questions about that person's inner critic. Now, let me be very specific here. We're asking curious questions. We are not asking solutions disguised as questions. Okay, so curious questions are, what color is it? Oh, what kind of hat is that? Oh, um, you know, like it, it, how well lit is this basement corner that they live in? Um, curious questions, helping your partner to really flesh out this character. Is that clear with everybody? <laughs> Great, perfect. So really just helping as if like you really want to explore this character and learn more about this character so that you can help them to create it in their mind. So that'll be about three minutes of sort of some questions and answers. Um, and then we'll switch. And the second person will have about two minutes to describe their inner critic. And then their partner will be able to ask them questions. And it's up to you. Um, sometimes it's really helpful just to be quiet and hear hear the questions come without answering them. And sometimes you might want to answer the questions as they come. So I will let each person decide which feels better for you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and set up those breakout rooms now. So let me stop my share and I will send um, timed reminders of what each thing should be. So let me set these up. I'm gonna assign this manually, recreate three breakout rooms. <laughs> Doop doop. Um, doop doop. Sun. Doop doop. Okay, and then Scott and Deb, you guys will be in your, you'll stay in here in the main room with me, and I'll just have you stay muted and you guys do this conversation with yourselves. Okay, so I'm sending you to your breakout rooms. First of all, does anyone have a question about what is going on once you get to your breakout room with your partner? Oh, he'll be here any minute. So. <laughs> That's okay, Stacey. Sorry, my son is going off with grandpa. I'm a little distracted. Sorry. <laughs> totally fine. Totally fine. Bye. Okay. Good. All righty. Here we go. Okay, room one. Here we go. Right. Hi, uh, Blair. Nice to meet you. Hi. <laughs> Good. Um, so. So you can't for a second. What'd you say? Wow. I've never heard of that. I'm very much an East Coaster. Um, <laughs> Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. So you've been in theater a long time, or film, or other such. Um, I've been involved in theater uh, pretty much since I was a very small child. Mm. Um, what about you? Nice. Yeah, I started about uh, 11, 12 years ago. I was pretty shy to do it in my early years, but then I did a couple of skits, and we did our first uh, high school play here is uh, Annie Get Your Gun. So it was really fun. Uh, our teacher asked me if I'd like to be involved with it, and I kind of never looked back since. I'm you know, doing it at very often community, and I just got my theater degree this summer, so well, last summer. So, so uh, awesome. thank you. Yeah, excited to use some of that in do their uh, streaming and stuff too and I, I worked with Emily a couple times she, she's always our stage manager for our local zoom zoom variety shows on the Facebook live so so she uh I was with that and I took a, a little like writing class with her too and stuff too we're writing our own plays and things like that so that's uh, did you did you hear yeah, about it from yeah um Facebook group that I okay. mean, actually she, she posted it in yeah nice. so I um kind of kind of jumped in yeah that's awesome. a no small thing to finish a theater degree yeah. in the pandemic i was 
in grad school part of that time myself. So oh, yeah, yeah wow. I I empathize with uh, how crazy that was sure. to <laughs> try to get a degree in theater while Definitely. no one could be in the same room. Yeah, it's tough. Shall we sit? <laughs> or uh, what kind of grad school are you going for? Other. Um, I I finished my MFA in directing. Um, oh, okay, nice. Very fun. Cool. All right. Well, I'd love, love, love to listen to some of your initial thoughts or sketches you had for, yeah, a few of the, yeah. and a critic. And um, we started with, um, remember all the way back there, like, what's, like, what it's saying, uh, the voice, like, things it says pretty often, and characteristics, and, like, personality of it, and if it has, like, the same themes a lot, or, yeah, some of that written down. Right, um... Yeah, I realized while I was thinking through those questions that um, most of the voices it was echoing were men's voices. Uh -huh. um, and so this is my, try to see if I can get the lighting where you can it. see this little cool. guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's him. He's a, I, I did not come up with a name. No name was coming yeah, to me. Yeah, that's the hard um, part. Yeah, the name was hard. Um, it, like I said, there were several names that he real people whose voices he echoes but mm -hmm. it didn't feel right to actually name him any of those names right, um right. so maybe that'll come later but yeah he's uh sort of a tall thin middle-aged man with a very severe expression often looking a little bit disappointed mm -hmm. um he's dressed like I guess you would call it business casual like slacks and a button-down yeah. uh I was not getting the vibe of a tie um, and those brown loafer style shoes that men of that certain generation always seem to wear. Uh -huh. um, I hadn't initially pictured anything in his hands, but when that was suggested, I sort of pictured a, like a notebook or, mm. or something to sort of that right. sense of keeping track of huh. things. Uh, Okay. And did you think much of his uh, surroundings, like where he, like his ideal, like, habitat, I guess? Um, I think he, he sort of lives in a, a rather empty black box theater. Okay. Um, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And respond, simply absorb the question. Like, yeah. Cool. So that's his main domain, and he's, like, overseeing the, the productions, and, and he's... Uh, you say, like, yeah, trying to discourage you from doing more of what you love, and, yeah, from, keep, like, holding you back from your, uh, like, ideal lifestyle and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so, something along those lines, yeah. Gotcha. Hmm. Would you say he is, uh like appears very often or like what like highs and lows of your life or, or it's kind of a more constant thing like da daily routine or only when things get really hard or really good it kind of be your That's a really good question main I, flex. Need to, <laughs> I, need, I need to marinate on that but that's yeah. a really good question yeah sure yeah. So we get to take our time with it. Hmm. And you'd say, yeah, he echoes a lot of your like bad experiences and other relationships or friendships, and it's kind of like am amplifying some of their your bad experiences. Like it keeps you hard, ha having to let go of the past. Like it's makes you harder to. To move forward with certain, certain uh, yeah. things. Yeah, maybe even less that it's tied to specific experiences, mm. but it just sort of yeah echoes yeah. the voices of, of sort of mentor type people who have no. carried a lot of that weight. Sure, sure. Uh, in my life. Gotcha. So like your uh, most recent message too said, yeah, more fear of me mediocrity than actual failure. And 
yeah, crash and burn failure. So it's kind of like the big leap into getting out of your comfort zone and like uh, taking control and going for what what you really want. And it's kind of hard to make that big leap when you if you get like too settled in your own routines and your ways. And it's hard to like really reach for like something you really want your big goal. Maybe. Yeah, I think it's like. I don't know. I, there's some some change moments sort of mm -hmm. coming up in my life, and I think there's you, know, you can there's a way to do it that's a little bit safer, and that's scary because it feels like settling for mediocrity. And then there's a way to do it that is braver, but also carries a lot more more risk, <laughs> the, the more dramatic sort of failure. Um, mm -hmm. For sure. Okay, so partner two, describe your interpreter. Partner one. Okay, so some of the things I had so far was uh, he would say things like, what I'm doing isn't unique or interesting enough, I'm not doing enough, and kind of the outlook of the world is that the world is a dark place, light shown is not strong enough to keep the darkness from invading, so he's kind of, keeps like the pessimistic atti attitude, and he reminds me of uh, old classmates and bullies, myself too, because I've had a lot of, like those throughout the years too, so, and five words I used to describe them was uh, like scattered, oppressive, merciless, potent, and selfish. And I'd say the inner critic thing he's most afraid of is inspiration. So if you're hardly inspired, that would keep him from interrupting you. And the way I kind of describe mine is like a looming shadow, and he's very aggressive stance, and kind of decked out with golden chains, very uh, regal looking, like very opulent sort of a outfit and such. And the facial expression, he'd have like a sadistic smile, kind of like an evil smile. And she asked us what, what he's holding in his hand. I said it'd be a dagger. He's like ready to backstab me in a given moment, basically. <laughs> and his surroundings, I thought of like a stone temple, lots of walls, like constricting pillars and cl claustrophobic. Kind of like a whole chamber of that. And just the initial name I thought of him would be a Malignag. It's like <laughs> combining malignant and nagging or something. So I just kind of thought of something initially there. <laughs> so that's kind of my initial stuff, eh? Right. I feel like so much of what you described is like, it was like it lives in a bit of another time. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. curious, like, is there a specific time period that is evoked uh, by these, these images of temples and regal? Yeah, well, I always the big like medieval themes and such, but I guess for mine it'd be kind of originating from my earlier childhood and stuff. So, I, like two different houses I lived in, and so I, I guess it'd be somewhere between that and such. Um, all right, curious question, up to you to, to yeah, same thing. <laughs> so yeah, just kind of in between those two houses, grew up with like you know, different family matters and separating, going from uh, place to place. So. So yeah, it's kind of like the influence of other time periods, history too, but also I like keep it more personal to my own surroundings and places like I, I used to live and sold a house in South, so I, I only have the memories of it. I haven't been back there since they remodeled it or such, so I would imagine in, in those kind of surroundings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think, are there any colors? to the mm -hmm. clothing i know you mentioned shadows but yeah the shadows i'd say yeah, the black there, and gold gold i guess yeah like regal like shiny like it's like it's kind of deceptively shiny like alluring bright but it's not any real light like falsity so it's kind of like the the false gold golden like a uh, coat coat that he would have so yeah i guess more like the bright gold opulence like it looks really appealing but it's not actually warm and welcoming it's kind of like the yeah, deceptive, like yellow, goldish hue to it, I guess. Like that. Yeah, black, dark shadow. Red or such. <laughs> and the eyes or just the smile? Uh, yeah, I don't really imagine the eyes. I, I guess it's just kind of a. Yeah, kind of like a dark ref reflection, sort of, so it's. Parts of it and. Kind of like imagine all like the worst parts of me, and it's like amplifying that, so it's. Yeah, like basically like a really dark reflection in the mirror. Yeah, shadow self types. And uh, yeah, I guess kind of dark, like misty eyes, foggy, like you don't really see 
very clearly. It's kind of sh shifting, such like that. Try to visualize. <laughs> but yeah. Hey, you said the thing that scares him is is you being inspired, yeah. right? Is that it's, what you? Yeah, inspiration yeah. generally. Like, yeah, like interrupt so he can't interrupt you. Like you stay on the inspiration and you continually inspire there. He doesn't have a chance to to dwell and interrupt you. So if you, yeah, as long as you're staying inspired, like uh, continuously. I'm inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just need more general opportunities and yeah, just inspiring from just general things. You know, be excited for other projects and productions and things. From like the right people and connections that inspire you, so making more connections basically. Yeah. What is the what does the stone temple look like? Is oh, oh yeah, let's yeah, we'll finish with that then. So I'd say it's like kind of like a pillars and you know, it's like a inside like kind of like a parking garage but more secluded yeah i can imagine like a got the pillars and it's like really like very tiny little spots to move in like it's not much moves from an uber it's kind of yeah constricting claustrophobic and you just imagine like all the the ceiling and the floor and yeah, a bunch of pillars and like i guess rafters and bleachers kind of so it's kind of just my initial like seclusion of that <laughs> All right. Well, got it, Blair. We're gonna head back twenty seconds. Well, yeah. Thank you. It's fun to yeah, meet you. Decision, you. Boston. I'll, I'll see you back <laughs> in the main. Right. Recording in progress. All right, Blair and I will be back. Yeah, I see you coming back. There everybody is. Yay! Hopefully you enjoyed that partner time. Um, and I would like to hear, um, you can share in the chat or if anyone um, has something really nice and big and juicy that they want to share, um, go ahead and uh, you can unmute yourself and share or share any insights that you have in the chat, thinking both about what came up for you around your own inner critic and what you learned or what you, um, maybe some insights you gained about just inner critics in general. One thing um, that we just realized as we were talking, my inner critic tends to be very busy. Like she often is doing, like she will be cooking, she will be crocheting, she will be doing things. And then it's like, so it seems like she should be too busy to be worried about me, but it's like, in that like stirring the stock pot is like oh by the way you really shouldn't be doing this and then like goes back to her cooking because she i feel like she knows if she just sat there and lectured me i wouldn't listen but when it's the like side dig out of nowhere it's when it really like sticks at me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting all right anthony in the chat says good reflections of how our personal lives and projections paint the inner critic and gives them such strong substance mm -hmm. Asking where my inner critic is, which is something I hadn't thought about, and hers and mine were in very different locations. Tell me more. Mine's in like a multi purpose room that's being used for a rehearsal, but it's probably a Sunday school classroom, and there's like terrible fluorescent lighting and those folding chairs with tables. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, and mine is in like a very stereotypical like 1950s house kitchen where there's that split level with like the gold rods and the lace curtains on half the windows and that's where she hangs out yeah yeah it's nice to know like all of these different environments live in ourselves and it's nice to be able to put a place to that character anyone else have anything come up for you um new insights new understandings it was very interesting to realize that all of the voices that it was echoing were male voices. Um, you know, take take that for what you will, but it also made it feel a little 
less like something that was naturally mine and more like something that had really been influenced, um, mm-hmm. which, yeah, I, I don't have a conclusion about that, but it was just an interesting thing to realize. Mm-hmm. Very powerful. Thank you. All right. Thank you for sharing. So a question that comes up a lot is how now, so we're starting to form this character. We have a nice clear idea of um, this part of ourselves a huge piece of the value in characterizing and casting our inner critic is that now you can start to see it as an isolated part of yourself, just one voice among the many voices that make up who you are. Um, And giving it that sort of, you know, physical form allows us to manipulate that voice and manipulate that sense of self-doubt and that fear instinct in ways that are more useful and productive. So that's really where the value of that comes from. Um, But it can be really tricky sometimes moving through life to discern uh, whether a thought coming up is your inner critic and that safety instinct, or when is it actually a logical, practical consideration, right? Because like sometimes we are not ready to do the thing, right? Sometimes we do need to do more work. Um, so but how can we tell the difference between those two things? So I'm going to put up um, a lovely two column chart and I'm just going to be quiet for a minute to let you read it and absorb it on your own. And then we'll talk about anything that resonates from here. Define pronouncements with real evidence. Curious questions, interest, and evidence. Either we're thinking, able to see the nuance, yes, no questions, is it possible? Open ended questions, how might it be possible? What part is possible? Repetitive, forward moving, focuses on problems, lacking areas, seeks solutions, speaks an anxious tone. City, one of those pairs calling out to you right now and really resonating is something that feels true for you and something that you've experienced. You can unmute unmute yourself or um, share in the chat either way, whatever is more comfortable for you. Yep, absolutely. And what I love about this two column sort of pairing these things up is that and this is a great example, is that it's it's really useful for when we recognize that this is the pattern we're in, we have the second column to help us break it. So when you notice you're in that repetitive pattern, when you're like, it happens to me all the time, I'm, especially when I'm driving a lot, um, I'll end up in the same conversation with myself like multiple times in a day (laughs) about things that went wrong and what I should say to this person and all these things. Uh, So when I notice that it's repetitive, I can pair that up with the opposite, the realistic thinking part, which is forward moving. And then I can ask, oh my gosh, I'm in this repetitive pattern. What can I do to move forward from here? What questions can I be asking to make some forward progress? Right, so we have a really specific um, pair to the the trouble, the useless thinking patterns. And I will share this slide deck with you um, in that email that I think just landed in your inbox. Um, So you'll have this so you can look at it and process it, okay? Some other things that are resonating are yes, no questions versus open-ended questions. Yes, remember that lizard brain part, it's not complex. It does not understand shades of gray. Everything is black and white. So when you find yourself, it's either this or that, right? Because it comes from this thing is either dangerous and I need to freak out about it or it's fine. There's no in between. So when you find that yes or no, that either or, you know that you're locked in this this frame, right? In this fear-based thinking. Um, Pronouncements, you cannot do this versus open-ended questions. Yeah, that's another example of pairs that are really useful. So when you find your inner thoughts making those pronouncements, you can't do this, you're not good enough, you're not ready. Oh, I can recognize that as my inner critic. Let me ask some open-ended non-yes, no questions of myself to break out of this pattern of thinking, right? Cool, and then Laura, you had your hand up? Yeah, I was thinking, To me, when I see this, 
I think of the inner critic as very childish and the realistic thinker as a mature adult. And so it's like the inner critic's very reactive, whereas the realistic thinker is like, okay, let's step back and assess this. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. that. That sense of perspective that you get, right? Moving into realistic thinking. Absolutely. Sweet. All right. So here are some tips and tricks for working with the inner critic in the moment, because again, it's going to go away. It is going to keep coming up. We have to learn to live with it and how to deal with it and how to still be creative beings, even though it's still there. So the first most important thing, and honestly, if everyone who takes this workshop, if this is all we're able to do, it is going to be, a, the world will be a thousand times better. And it is simply to identify those negative self-talk thoughts as the voice of your inner critic. If we get no further than that, it's still more valuable, okay? Because that's what breaks you out of thinking, of believing the pattern, right? Of believing the, the manipulating thoughts. Just say, oh, oh no, I recognize that. That's my inner critic. Yeah, really powerful. Then once you've done that, here's some thoughts. We're going to kind of start with our analytical brain and then we're going to move a little closer to our imaginations and our emotions. So analytically, when you notice that inner critic thought, then you can ask yourself, oh, that's an inner critic. <laughs> what is my safety instinct not like about this situation? Right? Why is my lizard brain freaking out about this? And what I love about this is it moves us into positive solutions. Okay, so for me, this I think I'll just use this workshop as an example. Um, I decided to do this workshop less than a week ago. Woo! Um, which of course is a little, you know, I'm like, I like this is stuff that I like am passionate about talking about. I'm super excited, but all these things came up. Um, and so I was like, all right, I'm freaking out. Two days ago, I was like, I'm just gonna cancel everything. I'm not gonna do it. This is like DD, my inner critic was like, nope, 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 nope. We're not, we're not gonna, okay. Um, and so I was like, okay, let's just take a moment. What am I actually afraid of? Oh, I'm afraid that like no one's gonna show up. I'm gonna have blasted everyone's emails and no one's gonna want this. Cool. If that's what I'm afraid of, then what can I do to prevent it? That puts me back in, in power, right? I can reach out to more people. I can share a little bit more. I can personally invite people. There's a lot that I could do that's in control. What else am I afraid of? I'm afraid that I'm going to sound like an idiot. I mean, I'm going to sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. It's not going to make any sense. Uh, no one's going to like it, right? Great. If that's what I'm afraid of, what can I do to prevent that? Yeah. What armor can I put on to protect myself from the saber tooth tiger? In this case, it was just uh, prepare, <laughs> practice, right? Like go over my slide deck again. Totally, totally simple stuff that calmed that down. Okay. Next one is look for the humor in what she's saying. And I'm going to share a little bit more about my inner critic as well. Um, so this is my inner critic. Uh, her name, oh, I don't know if you can see that. Hold on, let me stop sharing. Here, okay, so here's, this is my inner critic. Her name is Dee Dee. Um, and she is, you can see down here her title. She is critic number one in the office of money. Um, hold on, I can't read my writing. Uh, the, the office of money, they are going to laugh at you and you can't do that until. Okay, Dee Dee spends her days in her bathrobe. She chain smokes. And uh, she always has a cup of lukewarm coffee somewhere within arm's reach. Dee Dee is very concerned that I am a respectable person. She needs to make sure that I'm dressed correctly, that I am appropriately prepared, that I'm making an, enough money, right? And that I'm that the world respects me. And uh, the hilarious thing about that, we see this, right? Dee Dee spends all day in a bathrobe in a basement, right? That's hilarious. <laughs> when I can see that, then when those thoughts come up, I can just be like, oh, Dee Dee, I don't wanna take your advice. You are not a person that I wanna take advice from. And I can laugh at it, and which brings some joy and some levity to the moment and allows me to move forward. So find ways to laugh at your inner critic. <laughs> um, also, this is a nice, good analytical one. Choose a core value to lead you into this situation instead of fear. The inner critic is very fear-based. 
So what is more important to you? So in your journal right now, I'd like you to make a list of values you hold that are more important than your inner critic. Some examples are love, curiosity, compassion, generosity, courage. What matters more? And what is something that you're working on right now that your inner critic is speaking up about? Or another way to ask that, what is something that your inner critic is worried about right now that might shift if you move into a different value. When I'm working with my clients, it is very powerful often to ask this question um, in this way. Uh, let's take the value of love. What happens when you shine the light of love on this situation? What becomes clear if you shine the light of compassion here? How is that landing with everyone? Did anything come up that anyone would like to share? My inner critic really has no space for nuance, um, which in many areas of life can, if, if she were in charge, could cause a lot of harm to a lot of people. Um, and one of my core values is advocacy. And if I let her be in charge, then she's going to really mess up my work in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, there's, no, there's no room in her mind for nuance and thinking creatively to make accommodations to include people. Yeah. yeah. And I think you can say the flip as well that there's no room in your advocacy work for your inner critic thinking. Mm -hmm. So really when you shift into, wait a minute, what is actually more important to me here? Oh, advocacy. Then suddenly there isn't any space there for those thoughts, right? It's pretty powerful. Thank you for sharing. All righty. Let us today. move into some imagination tools. And a lot of these can be um, somatic, so involving the body. You can do them in your mind's eye or you can do them with your own, with your physical body. They're both pretty effective. So some ideas when that inner critic starts to get loud, you can actually physically get up and walk them out of the room, okay? So you can like push them outside the door and close the door and just leave them there. We're not trying to get rid of them. We haven't killed them. We haven't conquered them. We haven't squashed them. We're just putting them outside so that you can get your work done. Uh, you can pantomime. This is another thing that's helpful to do with your body. Put it in a vessel and decide what's most appropriate. If you're, um, you know, some people's inner critics might really want to be in like a fancy gold urn or maybe you just want a cardboard box, whatever works, but close them up in a thing and set that aside. Again, we're not getting rid of it. We're just putting it out of the space for the moment. You can uh, sprout a volume knob on your inner critic. It's your imagination. You can do whatever you want, right? Stick a volume knob on them somewhere and then just reach out and turn it down and hear those thoughts getting quieter and quieter and quieter. And then once it's nice and quiet, then you can ask yourself, all right, what other parts of me have something to say about what I'm doing right now? What maybe more evolved pieces of my brain have something to say, have some input? 
Um, you can put them in a shrink it machine, just like in Willy Wonka. And again, we're just we're just giving yourself a little more space by giving them less. Okay. Could anyone else think of um, an imagination tool that might work on your specific inner critic character? I see Laura cracking up. <laughs> the one that came to mind while you were doing this was doing a um, like the Zach Morris timeout where everybody else has to freeze. So it's like, look, I know you're still there and you're in the middle of your whatever, but like, I need my time out to like, me and my inner monologue need a moment to talk to the audience without you doing your thing right now. Yeah, very cool. I haven't heard that one yet. I like that. Anyone else? It's really going to depend. Yeah, Laura, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the image that was shown in my head was uh, gagging them, blindfolding them, and putting um, and, and stuffing something in their ears so they can't see, hear, or talk. So they yep. have complete sensory deprivation. Amazing. Yep. So they can still sit there spouting, but there, there's like they don't have access. That's that's really cool. Yeah. And Stacy, did you want to share? Oh yeah, yeah thanks. For, <laughs> um, when I would run a lot I would listen to Florence in the machine and she has this song about um, when the devil's on your back shake him out and um, I have literally done this like just almost like a hallelujah praise Jesus moment you know like shaking him out shaking it off and doing a little dance really kind of helps redirect and refocus and kind of laugh about it too so. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually uh, physically shaking our body has a psychosomatic, um, it causes a, re a relaxation response, which is why dogs shake. Um, and it's actually like a, a physiological thing that happens. So shaking is really, really good for us in so many ways. And I oh, love cool. adding that element of I'm shaking it off, shaking off the devil. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I'm going to walk you through my favorite, the one that I have learned that for me, when, when Dee Dee pops up, I can, uh, I can get rid of her within two seconds, like super fast now. Okay. So here's what it is. Um, and you can do this in your journal if you want, or you can just close your eyes and imagine it. So that way you have the practice of doing the imagination. Um, so close your eyes and take a look at your inner critic. They should be pretty clear by now. Looking at oh, little parts of their body. And you know a little bit about what they're afraid of and what they value. So now, what is something that your inner critic really loves? What would they just drop everything in order to indulge in? What would be an irresistible treat for your inner critic? Okay, now looking at your inner critic, tell them about something that you really wanna work on right now. And listen to their response. What are they saying? Just tune in to that inner critic thinking. Now without responding, <clears throat> go ahead and offer them that treat. Notice what they do. Let them get completely distracted. And now that they're distracted and paying attention to something else, in that space, tune into what other parts of yourself have something to say about this project. What other thoughts or sensations do you have now that the inner critic is set aside? Ah, 
And when you're ready, go ahead and open your eyes. And let me know, as always, if anyone had something nice and juicy come up, go ahead and share. You can unmute yourself or type into the chat. What other thoughts were able to come up when your inner critic was distracted? So I'll share, Dee Dee really loves romance novels. And so I can just hand her a Harlequin and she giggles off into a deeper, darker corner of the basement. And then usually what I find, because Dee Dee's very concerned with being respectable and every, having everything very well planned out. And usually what I find with her gone is something along, along the lines of like, just, just do it stop planning it and just do something, do anything, do one thing. That is often what happens for me. Yes, freedom. <laughs> Beautiful. All righty. Is there anything that you're still curious about, about the inner critic or anything that feels unclear? Wow, phew, <laughs> I mean, that did a really good job. Sweet, okay, so here's some next steps. The first most important thing, again, is as you move through the next few weeks, really work on noticing when a thought belongs to that inner critic part of you. Just notice it and label it. And again, if you get no further than that, it's already hugely powerful to isolate that part of yourself from all of the other more evolved and more useful thoughts. Um, I would love to hear which inner critic tool you think you wanna try first. Are you gonna try um, choosing another value? Are you gonna try putting them in a box? So let me know in the chat which one you can commit to trying and sampling in the next couple of weeks. It's always valuable to recruit support for yourself. So um, I have a few friends that know about my inner critic and when something happens and I have like maybe hopefully I'm having a breakthrough, I can text them and let them know that this thing happened and they and I don't sound like I'm a completely off the rails, right? Um, you can, here's, here's a huge one that I would love to see everybody do. This becomes really proactive. So a lot of these tools um, can be used in the moment, but it's also really powerful when you're sitting down to start creating, or if you have a morning routine, you can work this into your morning routine, just start by using one of those tools to set your inner critic aside. That way you don't have to wait for it to come up. You can just proactively, Didi, here's a romance novel. I need to write something, right? <laughs> whatever, whatever it is for you that is gonna work with your specific inner critic but make that a habit of starting your creation with that uh, moment. And you can always set up an, an, a one-on-one -on -one call with me. Um, this is for new clients. It is free for new clients. So if you want to really work with me and go a little deeper somatically, figuring out exactly what your inner critic feels like, get some really personalized strategies for dealing with them, um, I would love to spend an hour with you working on that. And I will share the link for how to do that in the chat here. And also, please, I would love to see everyone in next week's workshop. Um, it is called Confidence for Artists. And it's really focusing on, it's kind of a bait and switch. I'm gonna just tell you like insider scoop is that um, there's, there's no way to build confidence. Sorry, but what we need to do instead is we need to decide to keep creating even when we don't feel confident. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the workshop, okay? Um, so I'm dropping links to all of those things there. Um, are there any questions about any of those next steps or about the inner critic in general? Neat. Well, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> I am honored that you spent this time with me and that you shared with each other and with me so courageously. Um, please help me improve this workshop by doing the feedback survey. I just dropped a link in the chat for you. I also dropped the link to register for next week's workshop. It is also free. 
drop the link to sign up for a one on one session if you would like to do take that extra step for yourself. And also a link to my Facebook group, um, which is a little quiet right now and I'm still kind of reconfiguring exactly what's going on in there, um, but it could use some new blood and some new energy so feel free to join and help me figure out what what it wants to be I would love that. <laughs> And then please stay connected with, with me. You can always respond to any of the emails that I sent about this workshop. It's a really easy way to get into my inbox. I love to hear um, any new insights you have, any good, um, you know, if you used an inner critic tool we talked about and it worked, I love to hear about that. So let me know. Um, and you can follow me on almost any social media channel. I am at the Emily Stamets pretty much across the board. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for the applause, Anthony. Appreciate it. Thank you, Laura. Um, I appreciate you guys. I'm so grateful for our time together. Thank you for trusting me. Um, we can, would anyone like to, we can unmute ourselves and say a loud, obnoxious goodbye. <gasps> that would be fun. Let's do that. Okay, everybody unmute yourselves. I'd like to hear your voices. Yay! And we're going to say goodbye, everybody. Have a great week. Have a great one. Happy New Year. 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 I'm going to keep this open for a bit so that those links are still accessible, but it should also be in your inbox, your email inbox by now. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Links. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. That was awesome. Thanks, Thanks for coming, Stacy. Appreciate it. All right. Pretty fun stuff there, guys. We are going to uh, get ready for some hunt. Just a little bit, quick break, and we'll keep back for a full night of hunt. Fun workshop there. Gotta make sure I'm in the Facebook and all. Thank you, Alucard, coming by here towards the end, and hope you guys enjoyed. All right. See you in a little bit. We'll get to some great uh, hunt event here tonight. Great evening. Be back after just a short break. All right, see you soon. Back then.